Hi everyone, this is CK Vishukarma and you're watching Expert Insights by All Things Manufacturing. Manufacturing is all about creating products and solutions. Centuries ago, we had craftsmen making products by hand, hammer and chisel, customized but in low volume. Then we had an industrial age which enabled high volume, low mix production. With industry 4.0 and advanced manufacturing technologies and cost effective solution and innovation with IoT, AI, robotics, 5G. We are now repeating this history but enabling high mix, high volume product, customized and personalized product for everybody. Today, with me in the expert inside session is Dr. S.K. Gupta, Associate Chair and Smith International Professor, Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering Department, and the Director at the Center of Advanced Manufacturing at the University of Southern California. Welcome, Dr. Gupta. And for the benefit of the viewers, as an introduction, could you please share a little bit of your work, your team is doing, and the Center of Advanced Manufacturing? the focus area in terms of technology and industry? Sure. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to the session. I look forward to our conversation. So at the Center for Advanced Manufacturing at USC, we are largely looking into technologies which are going to benefit manufacturers which are doing high mix uh, type of applications. We largely look at applications which arise in aerospace and defense sector. In the type of technologies that we work on are basically robotics. So we want to use robots in high mix applications. Historically, robots have been used in mass production, but we would like to change that. We would like to start seeing if robot can be deployed in high mix applications. We're also interested in smart manufacturing. So there the idea is that Sensor costs have come down dramatically. There's a significant advances in machine learning. So then the idea is, can we put these low cost sensors on different machines, collect the data, and then run machine, alg machine learning algorithms on them. And that then can be useful in improving the decision making. So this will ensure that the process can be optimized. Uh, we don't create ever a defective part and since humans are also interacting with the system, we can catch and prevent human errors. Another area that's of interest to us is additive manufacturing, also popularly known as 3D printing. So 3D printing has now become very, very popular for making plastic parts. The people are interested in aerospace and defense sector, making metal parts, making composite part with additive manufacturing or 3D printing processes. So we've been investigating that as well. I mean, how can we uh, employ the same principles for these other type of material systems? Another dimension for our work is that since now modern manufacturing is driven by digital models, how can we use the digital models and then tie them up with augmented reality and virtual reality? That then enables humans to get a better sense of what's going on. They can play a role in decision making, optimization, even it can be used for training of human workers. And as there's a more interest in telepresence and you know intervening remotely, so all of that get facilitated by the use of virtual and augmented reality. And before you go in the detail of the processes and the technology, if I ask you your definition of industry 4.0, but you explain when you meet the mixer or the professional looking to transform their factories or the manufacturing, what in short you describe to them what industry 4.0 or zero means? Yeah, so from our perspective, industry 4.0 is largely about exploiting the power of networks. Uh, you know, Industry 3.0, we've already seen the power of automation. 
but that's a point solution. So meaning that you build a CNC machine, it automates a small portions of it, and whatever has been learned on that machine uh, cannot be easily shared. But once you get everything networked, then you can start seeing the benefit of this entire network effects. Whatever is happening on one machine, other machine can benefit from it. The data that's being generated, that machine can be shared and that can improve uh, planning, it can improve you know, prognostics, it can improve diagnostics, it can even improve future design of machine too. So this ability to basically combine the network with computing is what Industry 4 Point is all, all about. A good manufacturing company would already have good processes and the relevant processes in today's which are like decades old proven, such as the Kaiba, Fiber, Six Sigma, GIT, CO constraints, student activity. The way we look at these are mostly applicable for low mix iron production. Once you optimize the processes, then you just run with it. Right. Whereas in the on just enable the acceleration and the implementation of this process with the data driven inside. But also helps manufacturers address the dynamic demand from the market, moving the business model from push model where we just make the products in like mass scale and push in the market versus pull the demand and let's hear what customer wants and make accordingly. Right. So where do we see the traditional manufacturers struggling to change their current approach from process and thought process point of view? And what will be your top three four advice that they need to address as an organization before they talk about all these fancy technologies to be implemented? How what they got to change as an organization in the process? Answer for, for it is different for different type of manufacturers. So let's kind of take a look at it, your, you know, at least three different kinds. So let's take a look at a really big company, a multi-billion dollar company. And now let's think about the challenges they face. Money is not a problem for them. However, you know, basically what they are concerned about is recertification disruption that might happen as a result of technology upgrade. They are comfortable with whatever is working and they are kind of resistance to change, right? So their perspective is, okay, if I make a change, I need to train people, I need to shut down probably production, I will have a slight in your process, that would mean that I may need to then recertify the process and the risks are just too many. Uh, and, and that's the reason why, you know, sometimes they're slow. Now, on the other hand, if you take a look at a very, very small, uh, you know, company, let's say a, a five people company running a small machine shop, for them, challenge comes from the fact that, you know, basically often these people, uh, skill set in the IT and networking is not there. So they, so they are a little bit afraid of the technology. They, they can adapt and change fast, but, you know, just not being familiar with the technologies, a lot of information technology in the fit, because these people have been largely the expertise in manufacturing. So they face, you know, different sets of challenges. And also for them, cost is a major barrier. So they are very sensitive about the cost. Mm -hmm. For them, you know, the challenge is, okay, how, how do I, you know, get that thing done? Now, if you think about people who are somewhere in the middle, they are not, you know, large conglomerate uh, and they're not that small either so if you take a look at somebody probably running few hundred uh, people operation they experience different kind of you know challenges you know their challenges often they have mix of equipment you know they have some high-tech equipment some of it some of it is very legacy equipment so again integration start becoming a major major problem for them because ultimately the overall system has to work together. Everything has to seamlessly operate. Some of their stuff is ready for Industry 4.0. Some of it is not. And, 
and an integration challenge and the integration cost when they start thinking about it is sometime you know uh, enormous and that's what you know makes them kind of a little bit nervous so if you think about you know from different companies perspective often their challenges and motivation are, are different basically so when i was in china a uh, couple of a uh, couple of years back just before covid uh, the company used to make the parts for the aviation industry and before they could start the first production of a new part they had to do kind of certification through the new part, uh, part introduction process they have to show the part at the first time then send it to the OEM get it certified and then can run in the last production cycle so sometimes i think the industry requirements also i would say hinder is because this is the nature of the industry but hopefully with some of those technologies we could accelerate the process if we can't remove the process but hopefully we could accelerate the process for example one of the issues we were addressing at the time that this npi process to certify the new product it takes about 6 days for them but could we accelerate this process maybe for 5 days or 3 days and save some time out there so continuing the conversation so as you know the ai ot which is another term keeping it up the ai and iot comes together these require integration of various technologies sensor communication infrastructure as you mentioned uh, plus the interoperability across the system and IT and OT integration more importantly because OT technology is run pretty much in silo, but to really make a smart factory or factory of the future, the advantage and the challenge is to bring the IT and OT together. But at the same time, there are multiple technologies providers and potentially multiple use cases also within a factory that are seen various problems, uh, for example, supply chain or warehouse. of the tracking or resource management or dynamic scheduling for the production flow and potentially predictive maintenance for maintenance and for the department so what would be your advice as a strategy again to the senior leaders and the, both from the corporate side of it as well as functional leaders at farm manager so what seem to basically resonate with a lot of people is that if if the need comes from one of their challenges which they are facing so for example they they have a desire to reduce uh, you know lead time or they have desire to increase capacity so that they can basically do more business or sometimes you know they want to become you know environmentally friendly and they want to you know improve their uh, you know carbon footprint so so once you know it has been articulated and you have kind of management support for those goals so sometimes the challenge is that if you are looking at it that i want to deploy industry 4.0 i mean and you have not thought it through what benefit you are going to be able to you know offering as a result of it so that kind of becomes a more technology push and you know so we know that you know deploying and upgrading technology is going to cost it's going to have some disruption it's going to require new culture new workforce changes so change is hard and change is challenging basically so if people think it through that okay here are the things that's important to me for my business that i really want to minimize number of errors that we make you know in a year or prevent accidents once they have those kind of metrics then mapping out a solution that you know how industry 4.0 can help with that particular tangible goal seem to help and then what you can do is that you focus attention on that particular goal and then try to you know construct a system which meets that goal and, and while causing least disruption but keeping in mind that in future you may want to expand this so that this strategy seem to work well because sometimes people have been interested in industry 4.0 because ultimately they realize that there there are quality problems and therefore 
collecting the data right, right on the process and then basically uh, bringing it you know, into a centralized system where you can analyze it and then figure it out. Okay, is it the problem because of your supply chain that you're getting some material with high variability or is it your machines which are causing the problems or, or you know, for some reason you, you, you have a new workforce which is triggering the issue. So, so, but in that case, you know, then you can figure it out what is adequate to address that question and then your value proposition can be articulated well. Because oftentimes when value proposition is not clearly articulated and people want to deploy a technology because it sounds good and exciting and yes, right. once the deployment is done, clearly there'll be benefits all around it. However, in that case, the challenge always is, I mean, how do you justify cost and disruption and often then, uh, you know, some people, when they look at the holistic plan, they said, no, it's not going to work for me because I'm going to be down for three months for right. this upgrade and the cost that, you know, it's going to come with it. And then, of course, I have to train the workforce. So net disruption and the cost doesn't necessarily, you know, meet my requirement. So sometimes people think about it in the right spirit and they have right intentions but solution appear to be slightly over engineered and therefore you know uh, unlikely to, to have a buy in basically right? okay. so sometimes understanding what the challenge is figuring it out the value proposition and then constructing the minimal solution which can address that and while constructing your minimal solution thinking ahead and saying okay next year what else can i do with it you know, proves out to be a better approach than trying to, you know, upgrade it and make everything, you know, industry 4.0 compliant from day one. If I take an example, how we also work with our clients, as I said, we need to first look at the process problem. So could we solve those problems with either fine-tuning the process or re-engineering or redesigning the process itself? That's the best without disruption in the current business. Because I can't go to the customer and tell them, okay, this was XYZ, can you shut down your factory for six months and let me make it smart? Yeah. So that's the challenge that we need to think that how do we do incremental disruption within the whether through the process and through the migration without uh, impacting the day to day business. That's one part, which is challenging sometimes, but this is how we need to do. Second part you also mentioned, uh, which we also kind of uh, advocate is digital transformation or industry 4.0 is not a approach we can take through the waterfall methodology. Right? But we have very clearly defined the scope, we have the end goal, we are working towards it, but the risks are very high uh, because we are just working towards like, this 12 month down the line, this one month is particular goal. So versus if we do a short spring, like agile manner, a small incremental gain, and so there's a risk also and seeing the quick results, which helps not only the team to be also motivated, but also to get the buy-in from the TXO as well. So these are the few challenges uh, which we also address with our clients. Uh, that don't try to do everything one time, pick up the top three, four, areas to focus on. It could be your know, issues in the quality, it could be the workforce productivity, it could be sustainability, which we'll also talk about shortly. But pick up a few key areas to focus on, then drill down and define the use cases within those topics. After that we can look into how do we where do we put AI, where do we put sensors, where we have to implement AI and those kind of things. So moving on, uh, this is uh, another big topic and we are seeing this uh, not reducing but growing only, which is when we integrate the IT notice system as we discussed earlier, it opens the critical infrastructure for cyber attacks. And we have seen this in recent times, just like in December. Right? Uh, and this is only going to grow. What if 
we are talking about AGVs, we are talking about assemblies on the shop floor, but if this system gets attacked, they not only bring the production down, but potentially also harm the workforce walking around the working in the plant. So if you have to give some advice at a high level on this topic of cyber security in factories and manufacturing, uh, what would your recommendation would be for the companies who are worried about it, but at the same time we can't just worry about it and do nothing, right? because cyber security will always be there, the issue will always be there, so it shouldn't stop them to do something and take a step forward. So how would you help them to think and consider this topic to not to just do nothing because of the threat, but be more careful and approach to it from this topic of cyber security? Yeah, sure. So cyber security is, you know, a, a major concern and, and often that, you know, scares people and, you know, basically they need to be paying attention to it. Now, some strategies have been developed, right? Where, you know, you don't want your robots to be connected to the network uh, while, you know, they are doing operation. You, you want to basically connect your robot to network only and only when new program need to be transmitted or when the data need to be transmitted. So you could design work cell where you minimize you know, basically those vulnerabilities. So I mean, no, nothing is going to be bulletproof, of course. You can always have, you know, problems and, and, and challenges. But there are strategies that people have been looking into it and, and, and you know, investigating in, the, in terms of physical equipment, what can be done and when to have them you know, basically on the network and when to basically not have them on the network. And that way, you can, and when they are on network, then you absolutely make sure that they, they are, they are, their physical part is powered down. So therefore you cannot ram you know, AGVs into machines and cause you know, havoc. Uh, so, so there are strategies that can be adopted in terms of you know, controlling access of these things to network when they are allowed to be on the network and also very active monitoring, right? So you also want to make sure that you, you are actively monitoring your network. I mean, you, you are running everything, hopefully using your local network and not necessarily plugging everything into internet. So there, there are strategies that can be taken to make things a little bit more secure. And it starts with people because, you know, oftentimes you find out that you know, your, your people are not trained and they were the one who basically, you know, went and took some shortcuts and decided to, you know, connect their smartphone to the network and try to, you know, click on some phishing email link. So that, that causes the problem. So it, it starts with basically, you know, building more secure networks where you can separate your own local area networks uh, which need not be connected to internet. And you can run your op network operation without being on internet and also controlling access of, you know, machines on internet when they are actually carrying out critical operation and training people to make sure some of those vulnerability can be reduced. So a combination of it, but nobody has a perfect solution, uh, unfortunately. Right. So these steps can be taken to kind of reduce vulnerability, but there is no perfect solution. Correct. Uh, and we also work and under the cyber security in OT environment very actively, where we work with some of the solution providers, ranging from early stage startups, building unique solutions for, for device and devices, for the field devices, uh, encrypting the data from the device to on the digital network layer. At the same time, the large companies who provide network layer about security, where we need to do the threat intelligence monitoring, especially into the OT environment, because the IT kind of threat intelligence process, OT threat intelligence layer to manage so many different different OT protocols is even more complex. So as a rightly said, there is no silver bullet 
and the cyber security. At the same time, companies should not just worry about it and do nothing. Uh, this is not going to end. Uh, cyber security is a continuous journey. You can't just buy some solution to then presume it will kind of secure us for next 10 years. It could be as secure as maybe a few seconds before we start the conversation. Because within these few seconds, maybe new threats have come in. So, so this is a complex topic, which I think organizations need to think about. But as you said, there are frameworks, there are standards, there are guidelines, which we also refer to whether from NIST or NISA from Europe and Singapore specifically, like the security or IMDA work on it. So yeah, so cyber security is something we should be very careful. Another, which is a non-technical topic, but we have a lot of technical value add there is, you might have seen this growing conversation on sustainability a lot, and you just mentioned that we have also about carbon footprints, right? So I'm seeing personally the large manufacturers, especially, which are contributing to the carbon, whether they're in the automotive sector or, or aviation, and they need to look at standards like GRI index, how they report their sustainability uh, or UN uh, sustainability development goals for social responsibility, environment, health, safety, and those things. So, one thing I saw while it is a critical topic, but again, we can't be doing so many things in sustainability. So in your conversation with the clients or the manufacturing companies in aerospace or other industry, how are they approaching sustainability as a topic uh, in general? So most people are looking at sustainability, uh, you know, from cost perspective. So ultimately, if you think about many component of sustainability, they are directly aligned with the cost component. Energy in composite sector is a large cost component. So though in that case, cost is pretty much aligned with sustainability. Right. Uh, your driver to become sustainable is also your cost driver because you want to get your energy bill uh, to be you know, down. Uh, if you're operating near big cities, then of course there's a regulations which uh, kind of govern uh, that, you know, what you can, you know, Put in the environment, right? So, and therefore, you you require significant, you know, treatment of the waste that goes out. So, obviously, there's a cost dimension to it, and you really want to pay attention to that and and and, and ensure that, you know, by reducing waste, you're also reducing your cost. So, the, the dimension to it, uh, you know, also if you are working with, you know toxic materials and other things, then in terms of, you know, ensuring your worker safety, getting the appropriate kind of insurances for your, uh, you know, ensuring work workplace safety, again, there's a cost component to it. So, you know, it seems that we see push for sustainability where cost is also well aligned with it, basically. So in the, in the current climate, that's what we seem to be seeing in US that, you know, we are making progress in those dimensions of sustainability, which are directly aligned with the cost dimensions. And many sustainability dimensions are very well aligned with the cost dimensions. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, uh, and these are the low hanging fruits, I could say, uh, a large manufacturer who is spending millions or dollars in energy bill uh, every month, uh, if they could reduce, even let's say, uh, I was 10% of the energy, either by redesigning their facility, for example, just bringing the lights from the ceiling down, or making the, the roof panel maybe a bit more transparent, it's immediately reduce the cost. It is not a very like complex rocket science problem, but, but this is where it directly impacts the cost and obviously the sustainability. Another topic which you mentioned about waste management. So many manufacturers, in, especially in developing countries, as you know, they just kind of throw the 
rubbish out sometime into the clean water and they do not manage this waste that there is the coolant from the machines or some dangerous chemicals. So something these are the topics which I think the organization can be a bit more responsible, but obviously with the technology it can become easy to not only reduce the waste but also potentially track the waste and hopefully maybe if there's a need to penalize them also accordingly if somebody is not doing the job as, as they should be. So coming to the another uh, topic which I personally see is a is a critical as well, the jobs. Right. So while this is a long debate where companies and individuals talk about the professionals who lose their jobs or automation technology, but at the same time, in my view, government, industry and academia need to work together first to identify the skills gap. For example, how personalize the career progression journey for individuals would look like. For example, CK with 15 experience with two degrees, how will he look like in 2030? Right? And then he need to be upskilled for those programs versus throwing thousands of programs at me and then I'm scratching my head what I've done. Because I do not know how will I look like in 10 years down the line. So these are the things which I see. One is the skills gap assessment uh, at personal level. So if you could do some AI data analytics on that topic. But at the same time, the new kind of programs we need to build together. So in your recommendation, and this is again one of our key topics which we also observe when we work with our report clients. For example, manufacturing person when they are talking about advanced analytics, machine learning in the factory flow. So the workers and the professionals, they do need to know to a certain degree of AI ML technology, but they do not need to know as an AI ML engineer at Google or Microsoft. Right? So how we do the skills assessment that okay team x.0 versus team x.0 plus 5 is on the line. Is there any framework, is there any thought which the organization leaders, the LD department, need to think when they are looking to not only training the team but also retaining them for the long term, even though there is a lot of automation, but obviously the new jobs will be created. So, any thoughts on skills gap and the future of the work in manufacturing sector? So absolutely, you know, so there are currently jobs in the mm -hmm. US at least, right, where people say that there are enough jobs in, in manufacturing in the US where people don't want to do. So these are the jobs which are really menial jobs, still get done in the US because, you know, uh, getting them done elsewhere is not a economically viable option. So you still happen to have them and people struggle, you know, getting people to do it because even they get them, then they decide not to do it, they, they quit the job, the churn is very high. So that's one end of the spectrum where we are seeing significant inefficiency because these are the job, undesirable jobs, people don't want to do them. So you see churn, you hire somebody, they quit in three months, you get somebody else. On the other hand, then there are jobs which people have posted and they're having tough time, you know, finding right they cannot find people right and then they are looking into you know how those things can be done elsewhere so there is clearly you know uh, we have a problem in both ends of the spectrum on one end of the spectrum we are still trying to do jobs which nobody wants to do and they shouldn't be done by humans i mean you should have robots or automation do it on the other hand there are you know jobs but we have not you know created a workforce uh, which can do it. The challenge the way I see it is that unfortunately the previous way of thinking about it doesn't quite work because the thing is that things change so fast and the mindset is that look I'm going to invest in education I'm going to be trained in this particular thing and then I'll do this rest of my life and that's where the trouble comes in right I don't think 
anybody is going to last people the rest of their life, right? You have to treat them for yourself, you know, every few years. So that means that focus has to change in terms of continuous education. So if we still think in the mentality that, okay, you know, let's train people, let's take these workers, train them today, and then they will have a job. If our forecast is wrong, by the time we create programs and train them, you know, those jobs are going to be very short lived as well. Right. So I think the only way to fix this problem is, you know, that everyone should think about lifelong learning. We should all spend every day or every week a percent of our time trying to upgrade our skills and then trying to say, okay, all right, based upon today, what I know, what skill should I be acquiring? And this is not any fixed term kind of thing, right? It's not that, okay, I'm going to learn these new skills and three years down the road, I'll find my dream job and I'm set for life. It's not going to happen. Everybody has to think in a very continuous basis, right? That how I'm going to upgrade my skills this week. And that way you get in this mode of being, you know, constantly thinking about continuous learning. Now, that now requires significant cultural change. If people don't think that way. People say, okay, real education, then you do work, then you retire. But unfortunately, the world has moved on from that principle, right? So I think everyone has to say, okay, I work and I learn. I work and I learn, right, constantly. And people have to, you know, continuously look at it, what the trends are, and then how they get themselves gradually ready for it. This whole thing that, okay, these jobs are now obsolete, then we're going to take people off. And then for two years, they're going to train themselves. And then they're going to get to a new job. I mean, this is not going to work, right? But unfortunately, our education infrastructure, the way the companies think about it, who's going to pay for it, right? So people hire workers and they pay them wages for the jobs which they do today, right? Now, this mindset has to come in then you know companies will have to be encouraging all of their employees saying that okay you have to continuously learn you cannot just think about okay i this work will come obsolete today whatever you're doing for sure is going to get obsolete right so you have to stay ahead of it so this complete paradigm shift of continuous learning all the time will take some time to you know uh, you know get hold in in companies and also people will have to start adopting to this mindset. So, you know, so I think I think people are beginning to understand that this is a new reality. However, you know, basically, uh, I'm not entirely sure that economics perspective, we have come up with a solution which encourages this behavior. This is aspiration, aspirational thinking. So people know that it has to be done, but economics is not there. I mean, how do I make money to run my family and yet at the same time i you know find time to do you know continuous upgrade of my skills right but that's the only way to move forward because i'm afraid because right now a lot of people are saying okay you know robots are going to be here let's train everybody to be robot programmer fantastic that's the that's the you know great thing for next few years but guess what ai is coming behind it right so robot will program itself. So, you know, so you may have job for a few years, but as AI technology becomes mature and robot is able to program itself, you're obsolete again, right? Mm -hmm. so, so then, you know, simply saying that we'll take all of our factory floor workers and, you know, maybe put them through crash course on robot programming, you know, it is a very short term bandaid solution. That's not gonna fix your problem because we already know that AI is coming just behind the robot wave. And, uh, you know, basically robot will learn to program themselves. So, so th that's a challenge, right? So the challenge is that, you know, if we think in a very myopic way and we simply say, okay, this new technology wave has come in and therefore this will sustain people for the rest of their life, it's not going to happen. So technology will go through refresh very very rapidly we don't know what the time scale would be for many of the technology but it will be fast and mm -hmm. therefore mindset does not work okay. well, I you. Uh, as i said uh, we, have, we see a lot of ai data scientists programs from 
almost every university in Singapore as well as I'm sure globally as well. But my view, like you said also, that even if you train and create so many AI engineers, for the future days, it will be self-coded. We may not need actually the guys to write the code because program will write their own program and there's a lot of proven work is already been done. So we have to think, maybe how to think basically, how to learn, uh, to learn basically, is to remain relevant always. And the best investment one can make is into the education, is the continuous education. Uh, like I said also, the economics part of the solution has not been fully addressed yet. While some of the developing or developed countries like Singapore is providing funds to the individual level also. But there's still, I think there's still a long way to go. It will take maybe few, uh, maybe, I wouldn't say decade, but maybe at least five, 10 years to get this mindset change as the technology refreshment happen. So coming close to the end of the discussion, I would love to know a bit more about the center of advanced manufacturing uh, because the kind of work which you are doing in close collaboration with aerospace and uh, defense kind of sector, which is pretty much very advanced in terms of manufacturing and how we could as in uh, as a community or as the organization could also potentially if any opportunity to collaborate in this region, if there are options available. Sure. So, you know, center does, you know, four different things. The first work that we do is in the area of smart robotic assistance for high mix applications. So as I said before, currently robot get used a lot in mass production. So the idea is that you use robots on automotive production. You program a cell, the cell runs for you know six months a year. And you you so you can afford to you know take one week or a month to set up a cell and then the cell will run for many months. You know, high mix things don't work that way. I mean, you are doing one thing now, tomorrow you'll do something different. So, you know, if it takes you one day to program a robot, it's not gonna work. So we really need a smart robotic assistant. The idea is that you know you use the digital model, robot has access to the digital model and using it, it'll program itself. It will figure it out what needs to be done. Human can, you know, play a role in providing high level guidance, some expertise and skills which will be needed, but all the low level function of programming, the motion, you know, deciding how to tool, tool should move or what kind of force it should apply, robot should know how to do it. So ro robot should program itself, in many of these high mix applications, you're not going to be able to use dedicated fixtures. So robot should, you know, work with sensors and, uh, you know, should ensure safety. The robot should have machine learning capabilities to learn the models and it should be able to effectively collaborate and communicate with humans as well, because there'll be pieces of work where you will need human expertise. For example, a lot of inspection are still related to very subjective kind of criteria and, and humans are needed there. Uh, so so that, that's one part of our portfolio of the program. We're looking into how to create smart robotic assistant. It can be in high mix applications, ranging from sanding to composite layup to assembly to inspection. So wide variety of different things. Other important area that's of interest to people is additive manufacturing or also 3D printing. So we are very much interested in seeing how we can now do 3D printing with composites and metals. We know how to do 3D printing with plastics, but how can we get the same kind of benefits where you do the CAD model, press a button, and then basically out, you know you can print a part on the machine, and there's no you know human intervention needed in between. But how can we do that for metals and Composite. Now, of course, there are machines in the market which can do metals and composite, but they are very limited in terms of what they can do. They are not as versatile as plastic machines are. So there's a lot of advancements that need to be made in terms of cost, in terms of speed, in terms of quality, in terms of material choices. 
So we are exploring that for composites and metals, how we can get 3D printing working. Another dimension that you know a lot of people uh, you know currently struggle and find it challenging is that you know a lot of processes are not fully monitored. So a lot of legacy equipment out there, a lot of uh, processes which are not being fully monitored. So that means that if a you know process start going out of control or some error has been made or some system breakdown is happening, then it creates significant disruptions. Now your iPhone today includes a wide variety of you know sensors. So why not you know leverage the evolution basically in low cost sensing and kind of put enough sensor, even a legacy equipment. Not not the you know expensive modern equipment, but even if you had a retrofitted you know milling machine, why can't you slap on sensors on them and get the data and using 5G get it in the cloud and then at the back end monitor it? Use your digital twin ideas where you're simulating the process in the computer and signal and the sensors are giving signal as to what's happening in the you know machine. And kind of see if they're matching or not. If they're not matching, then you start issuing alerts, and therefore you can prevent mistake from happening. And also, if the process is not functioning optimally, then you can try to intervene and, and, and do that. And that type of thinking that also enables, you know, basically uh, significantly better plant maintenance. If interventions are needed, you can do interventions. You know, people can be look, located remotely. You know, so so a lot of integration of then telepresence technology, remote intervention. So it all gets enabled by this basically idea of smart manufacturing and putting sensors onto the machine. Mm -hmm. Final dimension for our work is basically this whole idea about leveraging augmented reality, virtual reality revolution. So again, if you want humans to you know interact with the you know factories of the future, then you will need to be able to interact with it significantly better interfaces than sitting in front of a computer monitor and punching numbers in a keyboard. So that's where augmented reality and virtual reality come in very handy. So those are the four different you know, technologies, robots, additive manufacturing, smart manufacturing, and augmented and virtual realities where our center works in. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to speaking with you again. So thank you for giving me an opportunity and I really enjoyed our conversation and I'll be very happy to you know participate again in a future session and love to explore collaboration opportunities with you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Mm -hmm.